A successful businessman approaching retirement was asked that inevitable question, to what do you owe your success? Any success, he replied, I have achieved in my public or private life, I owe to three little words. And those words are, and then some. He went on to explain, early in my life, I saw the difference between the winners and the also-rans could be explained in terms of those three words, and then some. The winners, the achievers, did what everyone else did, and then some. They worked as hard as all the others, and then some. They were as dependable as the others, and then some. They did their job just like everyone else, and then some. American corporations are spending millions of dollars today to teach their employees the secret of this and then some philosophy. Seminars and best-selling books that teach the magic of these words are touted in every business magazine. It seems the sports world has known the secret for years. Often the coach has said, for us to win this game, our players will have to perform at 110%. That is, they will have to give everything they've got, and then some. The principle is widely known today, at least in theory. Its practical application to life, however, is more difficult. There is within us, you see, a strong tendency to look for an easier way, to look for a shortcut. Our eye is easily caught by the approach to life that appears more casual and less costly. We want the dividends of a dedicated life, but we want to make as little investment as possible. We are much like the housewife who was confronted with a door-to-door -door salesman. Lady, he said, I've got a labor-saving device that will cut your work in half. Great, she replied. I'll take two of them. You see, a shockwave must have rippled through the crowds when Jesus spoke the words in our text today. Jesus was challenging his listeners to take a quantum leap in attitude and lifestyle. He was tempting the, attempting to take them to a plane of life they'd never considered. Indeed, they never knew existed. They had been carefully taught an approach to life that said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, tit for tat, do it to me and I'll do it to you. And Jesus said, but I say to you. And with this word of contrast, but, Jesus was about to introduce these people to a revolutionary and unheard of approach to living. And he laid it before them in the most practical of terms. Would you pray with me, please? Lord God, for some reason it's just in our make up to want to take the easy way out, to take that pathless that <laughs> is an easy journey, a path of least resistance. And so, Lord, help us to hear these words today. Lord, just take these words of mine, mold them, shape them any way you wish, so that they become your words, both for hearing and for our doing. In Jesus' name, amen. Anyone can love those who love them in return. Do that, and then some. Love those who hate you. Anyone can loan to those who will pay them back with interest. Do that, and then some. Loan to those who will never pay you back. Anyone can bless those who bless in return. Do that, and then some. Bless those who curse you in return. And if someone takes your overcoat, let them have it, and then some. Give them the matching sweater also. You see, in a similar passage, Matthew 5, 41, Jesus said, If someone compels you to go with him a mile, do that, and then some. Go beyond the first mile. Go two miles. Now, the background of that particular statement is significant. The tiny land of Israel was occupied by the military forces of the Roman Empire. 
And one of the malicious military privileges afforded the soldiers was that they could, by law, demand that a Jewish male over the age of 21 years or older could carry the soldier's pack for a distance not to exceed one mile. Needless to say, the, the troops' enjoyment of this military perk was exceeded only by the Jews' hatred for this act of humiliation and, and subjugation. Incredulously, Jesus was demanding that the Jews not only endure this demeaning practice, but double it by going beyond the first mile. I suggest to you that Jesus was not talking about carrying backpacks. I suggest that Jesus was not talking about a single isolated act. I suggest to you that Jesus was talking about a lifestyle to be learned, an attitude to be adopted, a principle to be applied, and a life to be lived. Jesus was introducing a second mile lifestyle. Jesus was calling for a revolutionary change, a totally new approach to relationships and social behavior. And this level of living would characterize his followers and easily distinguish them from the rest of humanity. This would be a, a people who would live their lives beyond that first mile. The first mile, you see, is mandatory. The second mile is voluntary. The first mile we must go. The second mile we choose to go. The first mile is compulsory. The second mile is complementary. The first mile is obligatory. The second mile is opportunity. The first mile is law. The second mile is liberty. Occasionally I hear someone speak of going the second mile as if it were a rare and infrequent experience that deserves special recognition. Perhaps that's true for most of humankind, but for the follower of Christ, it's to be standard operating procedure. Jesus has called us to live our lives daily beyond that first mile. Jesus has called us to live beyond the minimum standards of the world. Jesus has called us to a way of life that abhors mediocrity. Followers of Christ can find challenge more appealing than comfort and consequences more critical than convenience and cause more compelling than cost. One thing, however, must be clearly understood. Jesus does not call us beyond the first mile of lifestyle to make our lives more difficult. Just the opposite is true. Jesus wants us to experience and enjoy those blessings and benefits that are only found beyond that first mile. Life's greatest lessons are learned when one journeys beyond the minimum standards where the majority really seldom venture. Many people never learn those lessons, nor do they enjoy those blessings, because they never do more than they have to do. Let me share with you just three of the many discoveries we can anticipate when we aspire to live beyond the first mile. When we move beyond the first mile, our first discovery is joy. A deep sense of satisfaction and fulfillment enters our hearts. We feel a, a deep sense of investment and significance. Our lives take on a new meaning and purpose because we become associated with a great task. A noted American psychologist spoke of the first layer of fatigue. He says, most people work until they get tired and then quit. Thus, all they know of work is getting tired and quitting. The joy of great achievement is never theirs because they never venture beyond the first layer of fatigue. They never do more than the average. They never do more than the others. They never do more than expected. They set no goals. They win no victories because they fight no battles. Life for these people is totally predictable. They live in that gray fog of sameness. They remind me of a pioneer who built his cabin beside the first water hole he discovered. But the spring produced so little water that the pioneer's primary work every day was drawing enough water just to meet those day's requirements. 
His life, of course, was filled with a sense of sameness and boredom. The greater tragedy, however, was that if he had ever journeyed just over the next hill, he would have discovered a vast crystal lake teeming with resources. The pioneer never knew such a place existed because he never journeyed farther than he had to. When we push ourselves beyond the minimum standards, we find another place, another experience, a new arena of life, a secret land, discovered only by those who by intent or accident venture beyond that first mile. And it's to this land and life beyond the first mile that Jesus invites us. The secret lies in, in doing more than you have to do. The secret is in going beyond the first mile, moving from responsibility to privilege, from obligation to opportunity, from law to liberty. And the moment we move beyond that first mile, we discover joy. Our second discovery beyond the first mile is reward. In Luke 6.35, Jesus says, your reward will be great. Note he promises not just reward, but great reward. Jesus never exaggerates. In, in verse 38, Jesus gives the faith action that leads to great reward. He says, give, and it shall be given to you. Unfortunately, this verse is rarely quoted except in the context of a message on money. To, to apply this remarkable statement only to dollars and cents is to really undervalue its meaning. Jesus here refers to a biblical and spiritual principle alluded to dozens of times in his teaching ministry. You see, this principle goes beyond dollars and cents to touch every area of human experience. The principle of giving and receiving is woven into the very fabric of God's creation, the basis of the golden rule found in Luke 6.31, is that principle of giving and receiving. The treatment we give to others determines the treatment we receive from them. Jesus elaborates. He says, if you go through life showing mercy to others, you will receive more mercy than most people. If you go through life forgiving others, you will receive more forgiveness than most people. We see this principle at work all the time. Which student gets the most out of the educational experience? Is it the one who goofs off, neglects homework, and doesn't prepare until the cram session before the final exam? No, of course not. The student who receives the most from school is the one who throws himself into the work, who does the work assigned and looks for ways to earn those bonus points. Who gets the most from their job? Is it the employee who arrives late? leaves early, and uses every excuse to avoid or delay getting that job done? Never. That employee makes himself miserable trying to do as little as possible, and doing nothing is the most tiring work of all. The employee that receives from the job is the one who does everything expected, and then some. Who gets the most out of their church life? Is it those whose involvement is only on the periphery and margins? No, the best of church experiences is reserved for those who give themselves unreservedly to its ministries and activities. And the more you give, the more you receive. The powerful truth underlying the principle of giving and receiving is that it gives us a measure of control in what we get out of life. You see, we can exert some control over what we get out of life by what we give along the way. Jesus is teaching you can affect what you get out of life. Your receipts are determined by your investments. We affect what we get out of life by what we give. If you go through life smiling at others, you will receive more smiles than most people. But if you go through life throwing punches, you'd better learn how to duck. What you give is what you get. God has so constructed creation that you do not lose by giving. It's impossible to give yourself away. 
It literally is more blessed to give than to receive. And when we begin to give ourselves away, not holding back, we discover joy and we discover those rich rewards promised for those who go beyond the first mile. And then the final discovery I will mention on our journey beyond the first mile is victory. Victory. There are victories won only by those who go beyond the first mile minimum standard of the masses. And again, we see this all around us. The most victorious marriages are not those 50-50 arrangements, but those where both spouses give everything and then some. The most successful businesses are those where the employees give everything and then some. There are many causes in our world today. Many of them are good and noble causes, but there's one cause that does supersede all of the others. And it's, of course, the cause of Christ. When it comes to serving Jesus Christ in his church, there is no place to draw the line. We try. We try to draw the line and say, I will follow this far, but no more. We say, I served last year. Let someone else do it now. I gave last time. Let someone else carry the load this time. But then we come to our senses and realize that Jesus never drew a line in his commitment to us. How can we ever treat him so casually? When it comes to serving Jesus, we can hold nothing back. To save our lives for ourselves is to lose them. And only by forsaking our lives to Christ do we save them. Jesus Christ has called us to live our lives beyond the first mile. Jesus can call us to this challenge because that is the way he lived. Every day of his life, he lived beyond the minimum standard. He took no shortcuts. He cut no corners. He held nothing in reserve. That's the way Jesus lived every day of his life. And that's the way he died. The cross at Calvary lies far beyond the first mile marker. <laughs> Jesus refused a partial victory. His sacrifice was not merely a symbolic token. It was real and it was costly. And now he calls, come, follow me. Follow me. In the weeks ahead, you are being invited on a journey. The Capital Campaign Committee promises that on this journey, no one will trick you, no one will trap you, no one will try to make your decisions for you. We want you to travel with us. We need you, and it will not be the same without you. We have set our sights on a land beyond the first mile. We are going beyond our comfort zones and our trivial pursuits. We have had enough of the status quo and business as usual. We have decided to do more, to give more, but mostly to be more. No more one-mile living for us. We are pressing on to discover the joy the one-milers never know. The rewards God promises to those who extend themselves. And the victories reserved for those who go beyond the first mile. Lord God, help us to see the joy and the rewards and the victories that come when we follow your son, Jesus Christ, who never settled for just the first mile, but pushed forward to the cross to save us. And so, Lord God, over the next few weeks, help us in our thinking. Help us in our spiritual life to see how we, too, can press on beyond that first mile. It won't be easy, but Jesus never said it would be. And so help us, Lord, as we journey beyond that first mile into the second. May your Father God be with us. Amen.